Hello, and welcome to a spooktacular Halloween edition of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we look at the scariest objects in the night sky, discuss the question of whether alien life arriving at Earth would be dangerous, and we have a wicked conversation with Erica Engelhaupt, author of Gory Details, Adventures from the Dark Side of Science. Aliens attacking Earth is a motif that has frequently seen its way into science fiction, books, comedies, movies, video series, podcasts, you name it. From War of the Worlds to Apple TV's new series, Invasion, alien life often seems pretty darn determined to wipe out life here on Earth. Or at least get themselves some free snacks. And <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's uh, usually us. Launches, sir. But would this actually happen? I mean, after all, a species advanced enough to reach Earth from a home planet light years distant would be far in advance of our own technology. Barring a well-placed virus, either computer or biological, the human race would almost certainly be swiftly defeated by any alien conquerors who came calling. However, it is unlikely extraterrestrials even could feed off of us given our different biologies. Plus, there are many more potential sources of food that don't involve traveling such an enormous distance. So, chances are we're probably not on any alien's menu. Even Earth's water, which is a Occasionally seen as the ra raison d'etre of a surprising number of alien species. It is also unlikely to be a jar in real life, as water now appears to be fairly common around the cosmos. One of the few reasons aliens might arrive, laser guns blasting! is if a galactic empire decides we are a worthy target. 76 aliens lead the big army. However, any civilization that cannot evolve past wars over borders and economic systems is unlikely to survive its technological adolescence before they ever reach the stars. On 27th of October, the Cosmic Companion is going to release a new article featuring an in-depth look at the question, Will Aliens Be Dangerous? Make sure to read that article at thecosmiccompanion.net or on Medium. One of the very real dangers faced by life on Earth are wayward asteroids and comets. These bodies are relics of the ancient solar system, and roughly 66 million years ago, an asteroid the size of Mount Everest slammed into Earth, ending the age of dinosaurs. Today, even an asteroid much smaller than that, say a couple kilometers or a mile across, could become a city killer, quickly killing and injuring thousands or even millions of people, and also setting off a chain of natural and socio-political reactions leading to a massive disaster. Exploring asteroids can help us answer deep questions about these objects that could pose a significant hazard to the Earth. Currently, five significant missions aim to explore these mysterious bodies. On the 9th of November, we're going to offer up a special Asteroid Roundup episode. 
exploring each mission in this asteroidal quintet. Please make sure to join us then. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. It may be the bewitching season in many cultures on Earth, but some spooky sites have been haunting the cosmos for thousands or millions of years. Here's a few of my favorites. The ghost hand, appearing like a massive hand in space, reaching out for a red orb. This odd shape is, in reality, a pulsar wing nebula, centered on the dense remnant of a star that exploded long ago as a supernova. Continuing on our ghost trope, the ghost nebula, 1200 light years from Earth, haunts the constellation Cepheus. The spooky apparition measures two light years across and is the result of dust clouds dimly reflecting light from distant stars. If Hansel and Gretel were to ever venture out into space, they will want to avoid IC 2118, otherwise known as the Witch's Head Nebula. This reflection nebula in the constellation of Orion shines from light produced by the nearby star Rigel. Next up, we talk with Erica Engelhaupt, author of Gory Details. She's going to bring us on a journey into the dark side of science. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Erica Engelhaupt. She is a science journalist who's written for National Geographic, Science News, and NPR. She's here to talk to us about uh, her new book, Gory Details, Adventures from the Dark Side of Science. Welcome to the show, Erica. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So, you know, you explore a lot of creepy, gory topics in this book. How, how did you choose the ones you chose? Well, you know, I, I think that I have always been interested in the kind of weird, gross, eerie, if it's creepy, um, and it has science in it, then I've always been interested in it. Uh, so, you know, for example, I was one of those kids growing up who was reading, you know, National Geographic and Discover magazine, um, Cosmos, for those of us who remember that magazine. Um, and and I was also like reading all the Stephen King books <laughs> that I could get my hands on. So for me, when I, uh, you know, I have a background in science um, uh, and I studied, you know, biology and environmental science. And so for me, when I went into science journalism, I started really looking for those kinds of stories that just fascinated me because they were the things that people don't really talk about much, the things that kind of fly under the radar. And a lot of times those turn out to be the things that we are afraid to talk about, you know, or mm. afraid to ask about. So sometimes that turns out to be the stuff that is kind of gross or creepy. And... Um, you know, when I started looking, when I when I was coming up with the idea originally for a blog called Gory Details, which then turned into the book eventually, um, you know, I, I would just look at my bookshelf at the kinds of popular science books that I like to read. And they all had titles like, you know, 
blood work and <laughs> the killer of little shepherds and little, you know, it was all like forensic science kinds of stuff and um, and anything that was like kind of gory medical histories and things like that. So, um, so for me, when I started, you know, writing about that stuff, it just really kind of took off and I've really enjoyed it and was really thrilled when, uh, when National Geographic, uh, you know, decided to turn the blog into a book because that gave me a way of, you know, expanding things that I had already written about and getting the opportunity to write about a whole bunch of new stuff. So, so I started off, you know, just thinking like, ooh, what are kind of some of the things that I've always wanted to write about um, and haven't had a chance to, and can I get those into the book? So, um, so one thing, for example, you asked, you know, how, how do I pick topics? Um, it really comes down to uh, things that just catch my attention and fascinate me. And if there's some interesting bit of science that can go deeper uh, and something that I think, gee, a lot of people don't know about this, that's when I really get hooked. So, you know, for one example was uh, for the book, I got to go travel to a laboratory where scientists are studying the mites that live in our faces. And <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, I'm already grossed out. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, Please it continue. Is, but it, it, <laughs> exactly, right? I look for the things where people say, that's gross. Tell me more. <laughs> that's, that's gross. Good, Tell me more. That's a pretty good description of the things that appeal to me. And, um, you know, when I found out that, that scientists were studying these little mites that live in our faces and that they're basically living in all of our faces, like we all have them, you know, they're in your eyebrows, they're in your pores on your face, and they're on other parts of your body too, living in your pores. And they're so specialized. They, you know, the species, there's actually two species that live on humans and they're, they're specialized uh, to live in our pores that are even like shaped like little cylinders <laughs> so that they fit nicely inside of our pores. I thought, <laughs> I just, I want to see one. I, you know, they're, they're, real, they're so tiny. You know, you have to have a microscope to see them. All right. All right. And so how many people ever get the opportunity to see something that's living on their body? Right. Uh, so, so looking through the microscope, you saw this little micro microorganism sitting in a pore like a hot tub, pina right. colada in hand, right? Exactly. That's how this that's, works, right? That's that's what I'd want to see. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, the hard part is, you know, we they're very uh, understudied. We don't know a whole lot about these mites living in our faces because it's very hard to study them in our pores. It's hard to observe them in the wild, essentially, <laughs> <laughs> when they're just doing their thing because you can't really like stick your whole face under a microscope. But um, so what they do is they basically have to kind of scrape them out, out of your face. You know, basically they'll come out with the, the oils in your skin. So, um, so I went in and I got my face scraped and we put it on a microscope slide and the scientist is, you know, looking through there and I got really nervous. I was like, you know, what if I, what if she can't find any? Because often they're, you know, they're not too easy to find. And um, I mean, it took like maybe 30 seconds. She was like, oh, I think I see one. <laughs> and she ended up finding a whole bunch of them. <laughs> so it was really cool. I got to actually look through the microscope and, you know, see my little face mite, like, you know, still alive, wiggling around. And think how crazy that, you know, there's this whole little ecosystem on our bodies that most of the time we're not even aware of. All right. You know, I had a thought actually just before this interview that um, it's strange that, you know, we typically feel more connected to animals who are genetically close to us, like mm -hmm. the higher mammals, and sort right. of can be put off or, you know, disgusted by, you know, maggots and, you know, Insects. Mealworms yeah. and yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to eating them for people who eat animals, it's just the opposite. Absolutely. Isn't that ironic? It really is. Yeah, it really yeah, is. Why you know? is that? Do you have any idea? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Actually, that's a very good question. I think, you know, so much uh, of it comes back to that idea of disgust and what disgusts us and why. And disgust is this 
kind of core emotion that we feel everybody, you know, all humans uh, uh, feel it, but for different things, right? Because it's also very cultural. So, you know, at its core, at its root, it comes from being uh, repelled by things that could make us sick, right? So, you know, blood and guts could be carrying infection, um, you know, foods that, that could make us sick, you know, could, could be disgusting. But often what we're disgusted by doesn't necessarily make sense because as humans, we've really, we've taken that sense of disgust and we've elaborated on it. We're the most easily disgusted animals in the world. <laughs> I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. I don't think there's any other animal in the world that's disgusted by as many things and by as random things as humans are. Uh, you know, one interesting thing that I talked to um, a scientist who studies disgust about, she said that, you know, humans really evolved this kind of sense of manners, probably because of our disgust. You know, we have this whole system of manners that, you know, you, you don't chew with your mouth open, you don't, um, you don't do things basically that would disgust someone. And we do that to protect each other from our disgustingness, <laughs> which I think is, is really interesting, you know, that we, we are so easily disgusted that we have to constantly be on our guard as social creatures so that we're not constantly disgusting one another. <laughs> and, you know, this is, of course, the Halloween episode of the show. Yes. And so... Um... Halloween, of course, you know, has, of course, its pagan roots, as do most of our holidays. Um, but Halloween also combines disgust and, you know, gore yeah. with, scary. with fear. Yeah. What, what, what do you see as the difference between those two, and how do they combine it in this really yeah. awesome holiday? Yeah, it's, I mean, it really is. It's like the one day of the year when we really get to embrace the gross and the scary and the creepy all in one. Uh, which I think is a lot of fun. You know, it's like we kind of let loose, you know, that one day and we're not quite so uptight. So I think there are a lot of reasons why we sometimes enjoy fear and we sometimes even enjoy being grossed out. I think it's kind of a related phenomenon. And I think to begin with, you kind of have to look at what's happening in our brains when we're experiencing fear, for example. So um, with fear, you're uh, you're getting, you know, something, you see something scary or sense something scary. And that triggers a part of the brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala processes fear. It sends signals to other parts of your brain. And it sets off this whole cascade of effects, including your fight or flight response, which is where, you know, your adrenaline gets up and your heart starts pumping, cortisol, the stress hormone. But it also kicks off the production of dopamine which is a neurotransmitter in the brain uh, that does a lot of different things. And it's involved in the fear response, but it's also very involved in the brain's reward center. So it's also associated with feeling pleasure. So in a sense, when you are being frightened, you know, you're getting this whole kind of rush of chemicals and there really is kind of a rush, a high that you get when you're afraid. Um, and some people feel that more so than others. You know, obviously there's this like spectrum. There's the people who love the haunted houses and the scary movies, the people who want nothing to do with them. And interestingly, uh, scientists have found that some of the people who love the haunted houses, those thrill-seeking type personalities, those people tend to, when they see something scary, they um, are actually producing less of the cortisol and stress hormone and more of the dopamine, the pleasure ah. and reward chemicals. And so sense. they're actually, yeah, yeah they're, yeah, th those they're are people whose brains yeah. are responding in that way. So they're getting more of a reward and the thrill from the fear, whereas other people may be just pumping out all of this stress hormone <laughs> and they're not getting so much of that reward. So for them, there's you know, there's nothing in it for them. Um, it's just stressful and scary. So I think it's interesting. Um, and I think it relates also to what happens with why we like being grossed out sometimes. Uh, you know, it's kind of a similar phenomenon where um, 
actually, I've heard some scientists refer to it as benign masochism, <laughs> which is a name I love. Uh, masochism is, you know, where you kind of want to feel pain. Um, but the benign part of benign masochism is that you actually know you're going to be okay in a situation like a haunted house or, you know, or a scary gross out movie. Um, so you get to kind of experience some of the thrill and the, the, the fun part, if you will, of being um, afraid or being grossed out, but you actually know that you're safe. You know, you know that you're, that thing that's gross isn't really going to make you sick or the thing that's scary isn't really going to hurt you. So I think it's interesting that those are, they're both very powerful emotions that humans feel. And so we can kind of respond to them in similar ways. Mm, that is so interesting. And just, okay, <clears throat> what, you know, you talk about in your book about, you know, some of the, some creepy science experiments, you know, mm -hmm. out there. The, the phrase body farms come to mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, you know, what's some of the things. out there in science? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's so much creepy in science. <laughs> body farms are one of those things that, you know, sound really creepy. So this is where um, there are several across the country. There's one right here in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I live. Um, oh, oh that, that makes the place attractive. Slap that <laughs> right on the tourist brochure. Right. We have a body farm. <laughs> um, <laughs> the good news is they're not exactly farming bodies there, but they do uh, research on, you know, forensic science research where they're looking at the decomposition of, of human bodies over time. And you need to look at, at that in different kinds of environmental situations um, and, you know, basically different conditions. So there are several of these body farms where they're doing this kind of research. Um, they use donated bodies, people who've donated their bodies to science to be used uh, for this work. And, um, and they basically can do all kinds of experiments seeing like, for example, what are all of the bacteria that grow on the human body when we die? And mm. can you use those? Can you sample those and tell something about the time of death, for example, that's one of the, the things that, that they're looking at. Um, and it actually turns out to be pretty reliable, you know, and it's not that different when you think about it from, you might've seen on, on shows like CSI that they'll use insects, you know, if there's maggots on a cadaver or something like that, they'll use those and say, oh, well, the insects, you know, would have colonized this body this many days ago, that kind of thing. Uh, so you can do the same kind of thing looking at the bacteria that are growing on a body too. So they've got lots of different kinds of, of uh, you know, research that they're doing at those body farms. But it is a little bit weird when you think about like, oh yeah, down the road, there's like, you know, some patch of forest with a bunch of dead bodies <laughs> and they're decomposing. <laughs> <laughs> we put the corpses back in corpses to let die. <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> all right so finally where can people go and get some more information about gory details and look and learn more about all the creepy science you're teaching people about absolutely so you can go to my website you can go to gorydetailsbook.com and you can find out lots more about the book and where to buy it and things other things that i'm doing so forth so uh, you can also find me on Twitter at Gory Erica. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we're at, what else? Uh, you know, I also encourage people always, if you can, to um, to you know shop at your local independent bookstores yeah, if you have them. Local bookstores. And right. um, but you can also buy the book, um, you know, on Amazon and all of the usual places. And there's also an audio book version, which is fantastic for those who are big podcast listeners and audio book fans. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Erica. It was a lot of fun talking with you. Thank you so much. It was a blast. Take care. You too. And that was Erica Engelhop, author of Gory Details, Adventures from the Dark Side of Science. Visit with us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring the cosmos down to Earth and scientists directly in, in, into your homes with fun and informative interviews like the one you just saw. 
Next week, we're going to talk with Dr. Tara Murphy from the University of Sydney about her work discovering odd baby spooky radio signals coming from near the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Here's a preview of that interview. One of our hypotheses was that this was a flaring star. So I mentioned at the beginning the circular polarization. That's a very strange property of, of light. That means that um, the light is not only aligned in a single plane, but that plane is rotating as it's traveling towards us. And the two types of objects that uh, cause that the most are pulsars and stars when they are flaring. So we thought this could be a stellar flare. But when we search for it in visible light, we see nothing. For a star to be that bright, to be flaring that brightly, but yet not visible in optical visible light, it means that um, it pretty much rules out that a hypothesis or it's a very, very, very cool dim star and we need uh, better observations to try and find it. Subscribe to our VIP newsletter and see every episode of this show one day early, together with advanced viewings of our comics, jokes, and just a whole lot more. Now, we depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Trick or treat. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. Or at least undead. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, Please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or your favorite podcast provider. Remember, you can watch every episode of this show at thecosmiccompanion.tv. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Happy Halloween.